Hello, and welcome to the second and final episode of the fall season of the Public Health Insider Series. I'm Casey Farm, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations for the College of Public Health and Human Sciences at the Oregon State University Alumni Association. Hi, everyone. I'm Katherine Stroppel. I'm Director of Marketing and Communications for Oregon State's College of Public Health and Human Sciences. In this episode of the Public Health Insider, we're looking into a lack of affordable and accessible childcare and how faculty from the college are working toward alleviating that issue by supporting and training early childhood educators, thanks to a $14.4 million grant to establish the Early Learning System Initiative, otherwise known as LC. Tonight's featured panelists from the college are Megan McClellan, Bridget Hatfield, and Megan Pratt. Megan McClellan is the director of the Hallie E. Ford Center for Healthy Children and Families and the Catherine E. Smith Healthy Children and Families Endowed Professor. She is also part of ELSI, as well as the Kindergarten Readiness Research. Megan works to optimize children's development and her research focuses on children's self-regulation, executive function, and social competence for success in preschool and elementary school and throughout the rest of their lives. Uh, Bridget Hatfield is an associate professor in human development and family sciences in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. She leads the search lab and the coaching core within LC, and she is part of the Oregon Child Care Research Partnership and the Early Learning or Early Childhood Core, excuse me, in the Halley Ford Center. Bridget studies teacher child relationships in early childhood, as well as children's stress and school readiness skills. She uses that research to inform teachers' professional development and policies within early care and education. Megan Pratt is an assistant professor of practice in human development and family sciences and is a member of ELSI, the Oregon Child Care Research Partnership, and the Halley Ford Center's Family Policy Group. Megan conducts research related to child care and education policy of interest to local and state partners and convenes a virtual organization that brings together researchers, policymakers, and practitioners for shared learning around the issues of care and education in Oregon. The Public Health Insider Series is hosted by the OSU Alumni Association in collaboration with the OSU Foundation and the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. Following the panelist presentation, we'll have about 25 to 30 minutes for questions and answers. If you look now at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a Q&A button. You are welcome to type questions throughout the talk, and at the end of the presentation, our panelists will answer as many as they can before the end of the episode. For those of you that are new to the series, we welcome you, and for those of you that are returners, come, welcome on back. I think we're about ready to go, so let's get tonight's episode started. Megan, Bridget, and Megan, would you please turn on your cameras and unmute your microphones? The floor is yours. We'll see you in a little bit. Hi. So my name is Megan Pratt. I am starting us off here tonight um, with the first setup. Um, and what I'm here today to talk about is kind of setting the stage around what the challenges are um, around family supply, as well as the workforce realities um, here in Oregon. Next slide. So families really struggle to find child care and education options to meet their needs. Um, in our work here at um, in the partnership, we've looked at how much regulated supply or licensed programs it exist for the number of children um, in our population. And we know that there's about five children for every child care slot. So this is a mismatch compared to what we know about um, Oregon families with young children is that two thirds of families have all parents working. And so what's available doesn't match up. And childcare is especially scarce in different communities. Um, rural communities have a particularly low amount of childcare available. Same with infants and toddlers. If anyone knows someone with that has a infant or toddler or is expecting, um, and they're trying to find care, you learn that really quickly. Um, the the hard um, how hard it is to find available care, and also when we look in the research um, around 
uh, communities that have a large number of low income households or lower wage working folks, that's also a place where you see less care available. And we know that even if that care exists, it may not be truly accessible. And so a lot of families make things work by using family, friends, and neighbors and, and more informal care. That type of care really provides a, plays a really important role in our state as well. So on the next slide, another conundrum that, that is important to, to outline here is around family access and then contrasting that or comparing that to the workforce realities. So um, when we look across the state at the prices that child care programs in the state charge families, the median annual price of toddler care in a center is just under $16,000 a year. Um, you can compare this to uh, public tuition at a college a university. It outweighs that. It often also outpaces um, and out is more expensive than mortgages or people's rents. Um, at the same time, median hourly center teacher wages, so the folks working in those toddler classrooms, make wages that range on average between about $13 and $18 an hour, which works out to about $24,000 to $37,000 a year. Um, and this includes at the higher end folks with bachelor's degrees and higher um, education levels as well. And so this is a real conundrum. And when people ask why is there this mismatch, a lot of it has to do with the fact that childcare is largely covered by a private market. Parents are paying for childcare out of pocket. Um, and very little of the system is funded through public investment. So sometimes K-12 schools are used as an example of where public investments um, are, are providing some additional revenue to um, the workforce and supporting the workforce. So the reality is, although $16,000 a year is going to a center, about 80% of that is going straight to, to, to um, a provider's wages. So programs are running on very slim margins and sometimes deficits. Um, and so it's a real challenge. And this challenge became really clear during COVID when a lot of folks had to take their children out of care or programs had to close and that revenue source was no longer there and they're trying to figure out how to keep people in um, people employed. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, a little more about the workforce. Um, so a lot of the workforce in Oregon um, is doing the work and is very committed and dedicated to doing this work despite the wages that are characteristic of, of this type of work in childcare and education, especially for that zero to five, as well as school age before and after school care. Um, as of about 2019, the last numbers we have from the state, there were just around 24,000 um, people who were in the workforce, so working in a, in a center or a licensed home program. The average age of this workforce is about 37. About 94% identify as female or as women. Um, it's important, too, that this workforce is more racially and ethnically, ethnically diverse than Oregon adults. Um, it's also more linguistically diverse, particularly our home-based programs in the state of Oregon. The licensed programs are um, have a large number of folks who speak languages other than English as their first language, and they play a particularly important role for their families and communities. And three quarters of center staff have some college or higher. And I included this to, to emphasize too, that this is a very skilled and educated workforce, either through college uh, and or, and or community-based trainings. Um, and so this is also a very dedicated workforce. There is a lot of turnover, but there's also a lot of folks, a core folks who are continued on um, five years, 10 years on, um, and continue to do this work because of the value to, to children, to families, to their communities. Next slide, please. And so the final piece I want to add in here is around what the state of Oregon and other states are, are working on um, around the role of how can, um, how can the state and how can we look at 
how to support the child care system. COVID made really emphasized and made it really clear that this work is essential and the role that, that child care and education plays is essential, but it's also very fragile. Um, and so contracts are one way that um, public investments are being directed into Oregon's child care system. Um, a lot of these contracts, the majority of this is happening in preschool age um, programs and their programs um, that you may know as um, Preschool Promise, Oregon Pre-K, um, and there's also some Baby Promise, which is looking at that zero to three. And contracts are, are being used um, to provide both increasing that family access and supply, as well as supporting the workforce. And the idea behind the workforce is that it helps, these are contracts that are set up between the state and a program to stabilize that revenue that is largely re the relying on private tu tuition dollars. So if a child leaves, it takes a couple months to get a new child in that place and start receiving that money again. And so it provides that financial stability as well as an opportunity to help strengthen the interactions happening in the classroom, the well being of the workforce, and responding to the needs of the programs, um, which Bridget will speak to in a little bit. Um, and it also improves family access. So the programs that are being um, funded through contracts right now, families have to um, be uh, eligible. Often it's income eligibility. There's also other criteria that can be used. And so with these kind of contracts, um, somebody who lives next door to a child care program that charges more than they could afford can actually afford uh, if, the, if that program holds a contract that allows the family to attend for little to no cost um, to them. So it may, can make a real meaningful difference in a family's life. So I'm going to stop there. That's some of the, the conundrum and the um, promising um, solutions that are being addressed and um, pass it over to Megan. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Megan McClelland, and I'm the director of the Halley Ford Center here at OSU, and I'm also um, the director of the Early Learning System Initiative. And I want to provide a little bit of context around how um, an example of a contract or a center that we're developing in the Halley Ford Center that is really aimed on elevating and supporting the early childhood workforce in Oregon. So let me talk a little bit first about the Halley Ford Center, which is um, on the slide here. And it, we, we've been around for a little over, um, gosh, now 10 years, uh, it's hard to believe. And um, what our goal at the Halley Ford Center is to generate, translate, and share research-based knowledge to improve the health and well-being of children and families in Oregon and beyond. And we have four research areas, I'll quickly say. We have um, healthy development in early childhood, youth and young adults, healthy eating and active living, and parenting and family life. And what's been really great and, and so rewarding in the center is how we take and do really strong research, a very interdisciplinary research, and then we figure out, how, figure, how to, figure out how to translate that knowledge into action. And so we do this through a number of different strategies. We have some programs um, like the Being Physically Active Today and the Family Policy Group, we have training, center trainings that we had to put on hold during COVID, but we've been able to do the whole child training institutes. We have the Oregon Parenting Education Collaborative, which is statewide supporting parent educators and parenting education in Oregon. And then we have different lectures and seminars. And I want to highlight the centers that we're developing within the Halley Ford Center. We have a children's environmental health center called Aspire. And then I wanna talk very briefly about the Early Learning Systems Initiative. So it's a wonderful place to house um, a center that is becoming a statewide center um, in Oregon. So we can go to the next slide. So the Early Learning System Initiative is basically a statewide center that example of one that Megan Pratt talked about to support early educators and really elevate the field of early education and provide support and professional development for educators in Oregon. What this was created through a partnership between OSU and the Oregon Early Learning Division. 
The focus of ELSI is on community engagement with partners and stakeholders across Oregon. And we're really focused on using an anti-biased, culturally responsive and trauma-informed lens to support professionals working with children, especially those from marginalized backgrounds and populations. So next slide. So LC, as we call it, um, has a number of different objectives and areas of focus. We are really focused on developing and working in partnership with our statewide friends and um, other stakeholders in the, in the state. We are focused on creating a mentor coaching framework, which Bridget Hatfield's gonna talk about more in depth. We support competency aligned training that's evidence-based. And then we also are very interested being researchers at heart. We're really interested in doing rigorous data uh, evaluation and analysis, and especially the kind of data analysis that can iteratively help us improve, inform and improve what we're doing as we go. So let me move on um, and let Bridget Hatfield now talk about a little bit more about our coaching uh, core and focus in LC, and then we can take questions from there. Sorry, it's apparently impossible to unmute yourself and also um, <laughs> stop sharing the screen. Um, so, can everybody hear me? Yeah, you have to share your screen, I oh. think, again. Apologies. Um, so, like Megan said, I'm Bridget Hatfield, and I'm going to talk to you today about the work that our team has been doing um, with the LC Coaching Core. Um, within the coaching core, we have uh, two primary initiatives that we're working on, uh, and it's all to support coaches uh, who are working with early educators who are in state funded uh, programs. So those contracts that Megan Pratt was talking about. Um, one of the initiatives is to develop a mentor coaching framework. So we house um, four mentor coaches who work to mentor and support the coaches in the field who are then working to coach and support those early educators. So we have established a mentor coaching framework and activities um, that our mentor coaches and team engage in. And then we also, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, have developed coaching competencies um, for Oregon and our coaches working within the state. So I'm gonna talk more about what is coaching, what it looks like, why it's important for early educators, um, and again, a little bit more about the coaching competencies and pathways in Oregon now, at least working on that, uh, to become a coach. So as many of us are post-COVID, particularly in the early childhood field, what we see is that our early educators, our teachers are feeling burnout, they're feeling stressed, they're feeling under-resourced, um, and also given some multiple factors like Megan Pratt mentioned earlier, such as relatively low wages, particularly for those with a, um, a bachelor's degree. We know from research that many factors exacerbate teacher stress, children's misbehavior in the classroom, lack of support from the director or other teachers, low wages, among other things. Yet we also know from research that support, whether from fellow educators, or a coach works to ultimately support the educator, reducing stress, and often elevating positive relationships and interactions with the children and the other adults in their classroom. Given all of this, and given the stress um, of the population that we're working with, we really want to be sure at LC um, that what we're adding with coaching is a resource and helps teachers feel supported and heard, ultimately improving their teaching practice. We know from decades of research that coaching is one form of professional development that is job embedded. Teachers can do it in the moment as part of their daily activity. This is an extra. Um, and it's focused on the individual, their own goals and their own practices. 
Other coaching and consultation programs have found um, to relieve um, teacher stress. And these types of individualized supports that are offered with coaching can help teachers feel supported and heard, overall improving their emotional health, and again, those relationships and interactions in the classroom. Ultimately, coaching in early care and education, particularly practice-based coaching, which I'll talk about next, shows to positively impact and change positively teaching practices. So the model that we um, have adopted um, for our coaching is um, a research and evidence-based model. It's been scaled up in many states um, called practice-based coaching. Um, so research from within Oregon and with other states, um, including nationally, indicate that coaching that encompasses some of these critical features like reflection, individualized goals, and adopts a relationship-based approach again, works to effectively improve interactions and promote um, children's outcomes and school readiness skills. These factors that I just mentioned, like reflection and goal-based um, support are embedded in practice-based coaching, or as we call it, PBC. PBC includes a foundation of these collaborative partnerships, so it's a relationship. It's not that the coach knows more than the educator, for instance, they actually work together in tandem it's a lot of active listening and reflection. Um, they use data um, largely defined um, in order to really help shape those individual goals together. Um, and ultimately these work together to improve practice. So we, as I said, we have adopted along with the ELD, um, this model for coaching here in Oregon. So now it's our job to help support the implementation of that. So as part of all of this initial implementation work, this is a new initiative. Um, we spent a year developing and gathering feedback from multiple system partners um, to publish the Oregon Coaching Competencies, which we, we released um, in late summer just this year. Um, these six Oregon Coaching Competencies do reflect the high quality effective skills and practices that coaches who are supporting those coaches, or in our case, it's often early educators, should exemplify in our, um, in our coaching system in Oregon. So we did um, also ensure that they are at least widely linguistically accept, um, accessible and they are in um, both uh, English, um, Spanish, traditional Chinese, Russian, and Vietnamese, which reflects the diversity of our workforce. So part of the challenge we have as a field um, is it's attracting students to a major that, as you know now, the pay isn't great especially with a college degree. Traditionally, at least um, in my own experience and others, assistant teachers work to become teachers um, and then teachers to directors. One way that we at LC are working to support this field is by outlining and then supporting the attainment of additional credentials and career paths in early care and education. So once an individual is ready to move on from being a teacher. So these multiple pathways. In partnership with the Early Learning Division and other system partners, we're working to develop Oregon's tiered system of recognition and support for coaches in um, Oregon's public early education. So we have this tier one, it's for people who might be interested in becoming a coach. They might not yet be coaching, yet once they complete these activities and get this certificate, they would be able and eligible to be qualified to apply for a coaching position. In fact, just today, we released the pilot version of the Tier 1 certification course, um, which we are piloting with up to 50 current coaches in the state and then working with our evaluation partners to then revise that. And we'll have the full Tier 1 course um, available in English and Spanish by late spring of this year for the entire Oregon workforce. We also have Tier 2 and Tier 3. Um, these uh, tiers um, are currently still in development, but what we would think about would be tier two as a person who has completed tier one activities, has been hired as a coach in a, um, a state-funded early learning program, and um, really is working with one of our mentor coaches at LC to um, further develop and demonstrate that they're able to exemplify and practice those skills and characteristics in the Oregon coaching competencies. And then again, that tier three 
would be that person who um, is, a, is working to be a mentor coach, has um, really um, worked through tiers one and two, and is um, able to be able to mentor others and train others. And again, those are in development, so stay tuned. Ultimately, the work that um, we do at LC um, is not alone. Um, the things that we do have, as, as Megan, um, both Megan and Megan mentioned, we, we partner with many people across the state. Um, we have an incredible team of people um, who work to actually make this magical work happen um, across our cores at LC. And we have, an, as Megan Pratt mentioned, a dedicated a diverse group um, of educators, as well as children and families in Oregon. And we truly are honored to um, get to work in tandem to support them. I think Casey and Pat, that's all we have. Thank you, Megan. Megan and Bridget, really appreciate it. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of first question I have came from our registration period. Um, and it was something that, you know, Megan Pratt, I saw during your presentation, there was about, was it 24,000 plus um, uh, as far as the workforce was concerned? And, and this, this, this individual asked that staffing, is staffing a major problem affecting the lack of availability of child care? And if so, how is this being addressed? And 24,000 seems like a lot, but perhaps it is very much not. Yes, and and there's an there's been an increase in the the stress that child care programs are facing. There there's like many other sectors, there is an employment crisis. There's not enough people to fill jobs, and nationally, there's been research coming out saying other sectors have been able to bounce back, and child care is one of those that's lagging behind. Um, often I hear when I talk to people locally, they say, yeah, I can't hire any, I can't hire people because I cannot meet and match the wages that they can get working in retail or working in fast food or working in other sectors. Um, and so, yeah, it is a significant issue. So in addition to do the, the program have the space for children? Um, it's also do the does the program have the stable workforce to keep a stable classroom? And I know many people personally as well as across the state and that are that are struggling with that right now. So uh, there's another question that came in during registration, which is probably on um, the minds of all parents. Um, I know it was certainly has was a big issue for me when I had little ones and needed care. Um, can you give us any insights and recommendations um, for families seeking care? Uh, the, the person asked, particularly in rural regions of Oregon, any, any, anybody can jump in on that one. We have a resource slide. Should we put that up now? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, maybe it would be helpful, Bridget and Megan and, and I, we could just show that and maybe walk through um, just as some examples um, for how families, this is, is, it's really, it is at crisis levels. I, I will, I feel like um, we really need to support um, this field and this sector. Um, do you want to talk about what a CCRNR is? I knew as a parent, um, it wasn't that long ago, my kids were this age. And I have to tell you, as someone in the field, I, I was like, wait, what, what is that? <laughs> Megan, do you want to explain that one first? Sure. Yeah. So um, child care resource and referral is, um, is, is a um, set of organizations and it's a, it's a program um, that works to, and they're regionally located. So every region, if you go to this website, every region has their own R CCR and R, and they have much better names than R and R. Um, and what they do, and there's also a phone number two one one. What they do is provide resources um, to the child to child care providers, 
And in particular, the 211 works on providing access or sharing where childcare does exist. Um, additionally, the early learning hubs in different regions also work work on this. Um, but I'll say in response to the question of how to find child care, even with these things in place, a lot of it, and nationally we know, as well as here in Oregon, it's a lot of its word, word of mouth. And also being open to um, centers if you're someone who's typically looking at home-based care. And also if you're and and all, and looking at home based care if you're someone that's used to thinking about centers as child care i think getting like opening um that can open up additional options and in rural areas too we can't pretend or we can but we shouldn't pretend that our family friends and neighbors grandma they they are doing that work and they should be acknowledged um in doing that and often fill those gaps and do a good job I like that they're doing a good job. That's that's really important. Um, the next question comes from, you know, kind of the live chat. And I know no one here is a wizard or a witch and can see that into the future and has their crystal ball. So I'll try to frame this in such a way um, that, that maybe it has an opportunity to talk about um, if we go this way or if we go that way in the sense that this this person wants to know what will child care accessibility look like in the next one to five years better or worse and it seems like with most things it could get better or it could get worse depending on certain variables so you know megan megan bridget um i don't know if if you want to kind of tackle that or maybe start to talk about um starting small or, or really just in oregon or even from what you're seeing in in, in and around the corvallis and bet county um yeah better or worse i'm sure it can go either way um uh, where do you see it going and why or maybe how elsie can really help play a hand in that Bridget, do you want to start and I can add to yours? Yeah, I, um, Casey Beth, or whoever the person in this asked this question, it's a good one. I try to forever be an optimist. Um, however, having been in this, been in this field for 20 years and having been a past teacher, you know, it's, and also I, Full disclosure: I have a, I have two young kids in childcare, and so I'm, I'm living all, all ends of this. And um, at least here, and I think Benton County, um, it does seem to be getting a little better than what it was even four months ago, four or five months ago. Um, but you know, I think there's so many factors. Not everybody is returning to work, um, as Megan Pratt mentioned earlier, and this was one of our, um, our, our childcare director's favorite thing when couldn't find anyone to work as well they can go make $19 an hour at Taco Bell so why would they want to do a super awesome and challenging and rewarding job like work with two-year-olds um what I do hope um is that if there is one silver lining from the pandemic is that um something that Megan Pratt mentioned earlier is that there is more national attention to the importance of um stable um effective, accessible um, early care and education for working families. And, um, and I'm also hopeful that a lot of the work that we are doing with um, with LC and our partners is able to elevate um, that work, uh, to listen to what the field is needing, what our partners is needing. We're working with others across the state and researchers who've done really amazing work about what families need um, and more access to diverse care. And so I think, again, I'm gonna loop back on being an optimist. Um, I think we will hopefully be in a more stable um, place um, and more supported place um, in one to five years. And just to add to Bridget's great comments, I, I think that's the goal of, of something like LC, right? Is to make connections and to develop a statewide um, center where our goal is to really better support and elevate um, you know, the field of early childhood, the early childhood educators, and provide a more stable system for families so that they can 
um, get access to high quality early education. I know on the, the side, and also I think on the side of like being a university, we're very, very focused on how we can create majors that are career ready for our undergraduates at OSU. And I think that that is really important um, on many levels because it's going to do a lot to elevate the um, workforce in Oregon and early childcare. And I also wanna say something that, um, you know, the attention it's getting at the national level, I think more than ever, this area, this field, this um, situation and crisis in early childcare is getting attention because it has direct impact on the economic development of our state and of our country. And if we cannot provide a better, more stable system to support families as they are needing to go to work, as they are wanting to go to work, and how their children need to get high quality and consistent uh, early education, we we really need this. It's absolutely vital for the economic development of the state and in, in, in our country. So I think I feel really hopeful because we're making significant improvements. And I think the state is making a significant commitment to um, providing a really strong and stable foundation in this area. Sorry, I went on. You can tell I'm getting on my soapbox. <laughs> a bit, but why are we so excited about this? No, I appreciate it. Um, actually, it kind of dovetails into some questions that we had from the Q&A. Um, someone just asked um, where the state is in regards to publicly supported and funded early child care. And also, a kind of a twofer to add to it, does the Halley Ford Center play a role in shaping policy? I would say informing, perhaps, um, but also um, how you sort of help inform state agencies and leaders around these issues. And I, I know you've got a lot of work in that area. I can jump in and, and start and answer pieces of that and then <laughs> help with other pieces. Um, the, the, the other, the question around public investment, there's been significant increase in public investment. A lot of the, the state's child care um, system is funded through a block grant that comes from the federal government. The size of that grant um, that's gone to each state has increased significantly bef before the pandemic. And then there are additional funds that came through there. And, um, and additionally, um, through, through um, the Student Success Act and other um, legislation, there's been increased um, funding for for these contracted slot programs, in particular for preschool age, and um, and now piloting and thinking about that zero to three year old age as well. Um, and so I don't have the exact numbers, but I know that those are increasing and will continue to be a topic around how do we use these public investment dollars and um, and and as a part of the Oregon Child Care Research Partnership, we've been able to look at the role that those play in the larger supply. Um, and they play a significant role, especially in our rural counties. They can make up over half of the supply that's available in a county. Um, yeah, and we also provide information to around um, the state to the state of Oregon. Um, in addition to LC through the Oregon Child Care Research Partnership, one example right now is um, we conduct the market price study which and supply study, which helps um, inform the state and advocates and decision makers around what it, the price of child care is in the state and what the availability of it is. Um, and so that's a substantial, um, that's of substantial interest to a lot of the state decision makers. I'll just quickly add that um, in terms of informing policy, the state is really interested in our um, recommendations um, and objective sort of analysis doing, you know, taking like Megan Pratt said, doing, you know, the data analysis, taking statewide data, doing a really rigorous look at it, and then making recommendations based on what we're finding to the state. And I think it's really important for us as um, a public university, we are as a land grant, we are really committed to, you know, serving the people of Oregon and beyond. And so I think this is one way that we're able to do that. We also sit on, 
various um, state and national panels that can really inform policy and the work that we do. We have real strengths in this area at OSU and in the early learning sector and the early learning field. And so I think that that is um, all that incredible expertise has really been important to, um, to help support the, the work that we're doing. Bridget, did you want to say anything else about that? Um, you all have covered a lot of it. I'll just add some things. I think the, the third question in that multi-pronged question you um, asked, um, Catherine, which is, I think it's um, because a lot of the things that, um, that were mentioned, we also have ears to different grounds. And um, so whether it's a CCRNR director or staff member um, requesting to talk to us about, okay, this is what is really happening right now. And this is my this is my conflict. I can't make both things happen. Um, or whether it's a director telling us something, or an OPK, you know, having a, a meeting across collaboration, and they're saying um, different pieces about needs. Um, what we're then able to do, I think, which is really cool, is to sort of take that into consideration, figure out what sort of supports might we be able to offer, and then also elevate that um, to our partners at the ELD who often are not surprised that we are saying certain things, but there, there's also just more pipelines and so that um, we are able to, to support and be responsive and share in such a way that um, can actually um, influence changes in policy, which is really exciting. We're getting a lot of really great questions in the Q&A, so keep them coming. Even those that are trying to do two or three or five questions in one, like a White House reporter saying, well, I have, I have a follow-up over here. That's perfectly fine. Keep them coming. Um, we've been talking about LC a little bit. A uh, question coming from the chat. How was LC designed? Um, were parents and caregivers involved? Who was involved? How'd that really come about? Um, $14.4 million grant. Pretty impressive. Love to see that. Um, love to hear you brag on LC a little bit. Well, <laughs> thankfully, we have this incredible team of experts in this area, and we all came together. Um, and I feel really, really fortunate to work in such a collaborative group of real experts nationally and at the state level. And together, we really collaboratively came up with, you know, how we could build something um, that would be done really in collaboration with partners across the state. And Megan Pratt has incredible partnerships. We all do. Um, I think that's another reason we have such strengths in this area. We all work in various aspects of this field in Oregon and beyond. And so um, we all came together and harnessed these, these areas of expertise. And then we went out and we partnered and we got a lot of stakeholder engagement. And um, these guys can also add to this, but lots of, you know, lots of interviews, lots of um, conversations with different groups of people, stakeholder interviews and focus groups. We wanted to be really sensitive to um, not replicating and duplicating what others have already done because this is like, oh, this is the third time someone has come and talked to me about these things. So we were really trying to be careful in how we collected information, but to really go out across the state because this center is really built based on the people in the communities and what they need, and especially those from marginalized backgrounds or populations. And so we need to listen. We need to listen to them, what they need. We need to listen to what the gaps are. We need to listen to our partners in the state as and other centers across the state because they've been doing this work for a lot longer than us. And I think we came to the table sort of with this idea of we really need to work together to make this go. So um, I'll let the others add to, to that, but I thought that was a really exciting way that we did it. It's really rewarding to me. I could just add that it's an ongoing process too, and that there's so much that goes into understanding the realities on the ground and understanding how one community is is working through this, these issues versus another. Child care is incredibly local, and so um, yeah, it's like we're the the engagement and the need and the gaps are never filled and never done and so I think having that like mentality of a, it's a continual process um 
is is really a, a essential piece of this work as well. I don't really have anything to necessarily add. I just say it's sort of even a, a running a running joke within the coaching core team that anything that we ever create is never a final. Um, it's another version um, because it's still a living document because we learn things, we pivot, we listen, we reflect and we adapt. And so that's, it's, it's how we operate or at least attempting to operate. Thank you all for that. Um, one other um, question that actually was in one of the registration questions, we'll kind of skip back to um, the publicly funded question. Um, what impacts are you aware of or have you seen on wages when childcare is publicly funded? How does and how does that support families? I feel like I, I wish I had good numbers to share with you. I will share that one of the reasons that the state has looked at doing contracts is because they can start to subsidize wages and get them up. I know there's a goal um, of pay parity with kindergarten teachers and with elementary school teachers. Um, and there's there's still a gap there and there's problem solving around how do we do this um, that's, that's underway. But um, it does increase wages. And we do know that publicly funded programs, if many of them are run out of K-12 schools. And when that happens, often the wages are higher because they're using the K-12 school um, pay scales. Um, so that's a little bit, it's not tons of information, but that it is, it definitely plays a role and is a way that public investment can help address those wage gaps. And is it too far to assume that if that were to happen, there might be like uh, more providers, more care, better care as a result or? Yeah, I mean, I think there's the issue of retention and, and can I continue to do this work for the wages I have, I, I'm a former child care provider. I did infant and toddler care, and I did look at the option of continuing to care for babies versus go to grad school and make more going to school than that. And like, so, so I think there is definitely that. And there's um, also because the system is growing. Um, so the state's creating a department of early learning and care. There's also more jobs directly working with children as well as indirectly um, and career pathways where folks can can continue working in the field. Um, but yeah, I mean, in short, yeah, let's keep people around, but let's also be careful um, about how the investments are happening so that we're not, um, it can, so that, so that all people doing this works that uh, work is valued and not only in the K-12 system, for example. Thank you. Well, we're glad you're here and advocating for providers. So thank you. You know, another question in the Q&A portion brought up something that, you know, I'm not so sure, uh, Megan, Megan, Bridget, how much you, you have um, delved into this one, but I thought it was really interesting um, if you have any kind of in, uh, knowledge on it. Um, what portion of the issue around child care do you think um, the availability or cost of facilities plays into a role? Um, I know when I was a kid growing up in rural Oregon, um, it was, you know, part of somebody's house. Uh, from what I can remember, I don't know, I was four. It's all kind of blurry now as I'm getting older. Uh, but what part does that really play? And, and how much does that limit um, the ability to either start something or maintain something um, or even be able to to run something efficiently. Megan Pratt, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I want to be like, look at this research I have, but I and I don't. But what I can say is talk to any of your local child care resource and referrals, look up who they are. They can tell you that yes, um, facilities are a significant issue. Many people do run programs out of their homes to be approved by licensing. There are certain things that need to be set up. Um, a building needs to have certain um, certain things. I, that's not the right way to say it, but 
um, number of exits, they need to have a certain amount of square footage. And so that does become an issue and is something that I've heard a lot of local communities working on around donating space, around, um, uh, around subsidizing. So a lot of churches will subsidize and that's often a lower tuition, lower um, rate. And so, yeah, so facilities are a significant, a significant issue, whether that facility is a home or a center or otherwise. Um, and there is a cost involved in, in getting a, a building equip for, for, um, for care and education. Can I add a crazy example of this? Um, just the variability. I mean, it, it, it's striking to me, the variability in, in these facilities and what's, what's available for kids. And um, we're working on, on one of our research studies with a number of child care centers. And one of our graduate students was going out there to, to work in the center. And the center <laughs> was 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 in it part of a DMV. It was like the next door in the DMV. Like there was a there's a building and they were like, um, we're at the DMV. And they said, oh yeah, the preschools just go down that hall. That's where the preschool is. And so I said, well, if you need to do anything about your driver's license, you know, you get both things covered at once. But it just tells you this is this is what we're working with. And there's just huge variability. It, it's a big, it's a big issue. You know, how can we provide some consistent support across the system? Um, it's 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 a major, I mean I'm joking but I'm not joking you know there seems to be a natural alliance there about patients between going to the DMV and patients and caregiving so perhaps there was some mm -hmm. sort of symbiosis there Bridget I know you had something else you wanted to add yeah oddly enough it was um again and um it's so time that we all work together um I agree with Megan I this is a great question um you know we don't have a lot of great research on that. I also have, you know, the two anecdotal stories. One is how one of our big, large childcare programs here in Corvallis had to close because they couldn't afford to fix their floor um, and they couldn't find money for it. And with our other, with a, a supplemental grant that we have with Oregon Department of Ed um, within LC, they also, um, that works on inclusion and working to um, establish um, childcare programs that are um, that are accessible to all. What we also know from that grant is that one um, one county that's participating in this um, initiative um, was like, okay, well, our goal is to actually find a place and, um, and and build one because we don't have one. And luckily that the funds are able to pay for that, but it is, it is a huge challenge. And the issue around licensing for homes, um, I hear, I work a lot with home-based providers historically and um, a lot of them won't become licensed and then aren't then eligible for these sort of contracted slots and other things because they don't want to put a sink. They don't want to pay money to have a contractor come in and put a sink in or put a, a door in um, and, or they don't meet the square footage. And so there are, there are, um, there are a lot of challenges to space. Casey, do we have time for one more question? I think we got time for two more. So let's two let's more. Make, okay. Well, two more. I have a two for, you know, me. So um, I'll try. <laughs> um, th this is really for Bridget, I think. Um, we had a couple of questions about coaching, sort of what is it and how do you receive coaching certification and what's that time frame look like? So I'll start with the easy part, which is coaching certification and what that time frame looks like. Um, great question. We um, again hope to have results from our pilot um, that just got released today for tier one. Um, we hope to have results from that in February and then we'll turn around and make revisions and tier one uh, certification will be available um, to all of those in Oregon um, by late spring. Um, ask me in a few more months about official release of tier two. I would imagine it would be sometime. Um, we are currently developing that and we'll begin piloting it this year. So let's just say spring 2024-ish, um, we might be able to um, have a program in place. And then tier three, I, you know, I have a colleague in Texas who is doing similar work at the state level. And she's like saying that's like a five-year um, sort of plan to get to a system that can support tier three. So stay tuned. Um, but coaching, I think it's one of the favorite things about the work that I've done historically um, within research and with teachers is that coaching isn't scary. Coaching isn't um, isn't something that should cause stress. Um, 
And when we think about the practice-based coaching model, it could be, hey, I really want to, I want to work on the kid language skills in my classroom. And so the coach and educator work together and they're like, okay, you know what? Let's work on open-ended questions. And so they come up with some strategies, they read some resources, um, they learn more about what does that look like. They might plan some activities. You know, one of my favorite tricks is I'm going to write opening the questions in the book that I'm going to read during story time. And then what happens is the coach comes in, does a focused observation. So they're really looking for those practices that really facilitate opening the questions that the coach and the coachee have been working on. They do a quick um, observation. There might be some modeling or other strategies that happen during that visit. And then they meet and debrief. They reflect, how do you think that went? Well, I saw this. I thought this went really well. They give some supportive and very specific constructive feedback. And so it's really this, this model that's often seen in intentional teaching that know, see, do, plan, and reflect. Um, that's really what practice-based coaching also looks like in the moment. Awesome. Thank you. You know, we're, we're running uh, short on time, but I want to get this one in really quickly before we come to some final thoughts. Um, how does or does this work get shared with our state legislators? Um, I can chime in. Um, so um, I in my position in the Oregon Child Care Research Partnership, as well as, as with Elsie, um, we put out reports. So sometimes the communication is reports. Um, we did share, and I think we'll share the early learners website um, that has some of those reports. Um, also working with the state, sometimes during the legislative session, will be invited to provide testimony around um, some of these issues to inform then the policymaking process. Um, so that's another, another way, um, as well as talking with our regional and local decision makers um, who, are, who are making decisions on that level as well. Lovely, thanks, Megan. Thanks. Um, the last thing we want to do before we get out of here is something that's really important for the Public Health Insider Series, and that is action items or next next steps. Megan, Megan, Bridget, you know, is there, you know, last 30 seconds from each of you, is there anything that you want to share with our audience about how they can get involved or where they can find some more resources? I know we had a resource slide up earlier um, that they can go back and watch the recording, and there's lots of great ways to do that, um, to go back into this episode. But any last things that you want to make sure that you leave our audience with tonight? If you know a teacher, thank them a lot. <laughs> That's my action item. I love it. I agree. They are just um, doing tremendous work. And um, I think also encourage people to go into the field um, because we're working really hard to elevate it and better support it in ways that can really create um, career ready options for our students and professionals out there in the field. Um, so I think that's another thing and, and support the, you know, the work and the policies um, at a state level, because this is also strengthening the system. That's what is going to provide more stable um, system and consistent uh, high quality education for young kids. Great. Well said. I think we're, we're out of time. Correct, Casey? wrap it up. So sadly, we are out of time. It's been a really great um, discussion. Um, I do want to give a big, big thank, uh, big thank you and shout out to Megan, Bridget, and Megan for the great conversation um, on the lack of affordable and accessible child care and what you're doing to help close that gap. Um, I also want to thank our outstanding audience for all the great questions that we had tonight. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. If you want to learn more about the work that's being done by the Early Learning System Initiative, or otherwise known as ELSI, you can go to the college website, uh, health.oregonstate.edu, and then just do a slash ELSI, E-L-S-I. Uh, so Casey and I will return with the Public Health Insider Series in the winter with our next episode, which will be Tuesday, February 7th. Uh, you can visit um, the site at fororegonstate.org backslash PHI for more details on this episode and more and to go back and rewatch or reshare or share with a friend um, some episodes from the series. Lastly, each attendee will receive an email from me tomorrow that will include items like more ways 
for you to connect with Oregon State, as well as a brief survey about tonight's event. Uh, Catherine, and I would very much appreciate if you could take a moment to fill that out so we can continue to bring you more programming from the college and from the alumni association that you are interested in. We look forward to hosting each of you again for the next episode again in the series on February 7th. Until then, have a happy holidays and a wonderful evening. Thank you.